Hey everyone, in this episode, I get to sit down with Dominic DeSouza from Smart Catholic, talking about Catholic marketing and how we can use storytelling to set the world on fire. So all that and more coming up next. Dominic, welcome to the Catholic Link Show. Hey Drew, thanks for having me. Good to be here. So for our listeners who don't know Dominic, I'm really excited to, to have this talk. We're going to be talking about marketing and how to tell good stories as Catholic and Catholics and why that matters. Uh, but Dominic is the founder of Smart Catholics, which is a website, kind of a social network dedicated to Catholics connecting. And he is a marketer and an author and a dad and a lot of other things that we're going to get into here. So Dominic, could you tell us, give us a little bit of your, you know, your faith background. How did you come to, to found Smart Catholics? And um, yeah, just tell us a little about yourself. Sure. Thanks. So I'm incredibly grateful to be born a, a cradle Catholic um, and a very multicultural background. So I was uh, born in New Zealand. Um, my dad, though, was from Brazil. My mom's from California. And he liked traveling. He liked teaching. Yeah, he was a linguist um, and uh, motivational speaker, that sort of thing. So born in New Zealand and then went to school in Fiji, uh, grew up mostly in Australia, had a lot of Malaysian grandmothers and aunts, you know, Filipinos. They were wonderful people. And then um, uh, I did uh, 11th grade in a French boarding school and then wrapped up my homeschooling in the United States and then just fell right into uh, working in the family business and uh, discovered, well, I guess I like marketing. I like graphic design, building websites, that sort of thing. But that love of, like you said, storytelling, um, Ever since forever, I've loved reading. And then that blossomed into writing novels and writing stories and just loving that. And then uh, getting married about uh, 10 years ago, and I'm privileged now to have a beautiful little girl. And uh, we've adopted a corgi, um, <laughs> as we were saying before. Uh, not had much of a time to really do any creative writing or <clears throat> fiction or you know that sort of thing. So I discovered that you could take all of that energy that goes into writing stories and then apply that to marketing. And, uh, and that's what really f made me fall in love with marketing and branding and all that business stuff. Um, but deep down was this, this really deep love of the faith, deep love of, of our church. And I went through a bit of a conversion experience around 2012. I like to think it was because of the, the Mayan apocalypse and, uh, our Lady's, uh, Lady of Guadalupe's feast day, which was right on the day of the apocalypse. And I like to think tongue in cheek, she rescued us because that was her feast day on that day. And so I've got a little, so that was part of a conversion experience of taking my faith more seriously and not just sort of sleepwalking through the rituals and just, you know, stuff that was passed on, but actually wanting to understand it and enter into it, you know, really seriously with a full commitment, that sort of thing, completely broke my life in half. And as, you know, Christ does, is want to do. And so it's been a 10-year journey then, you know, through that. And this was leading up to Smart Catholics, because the biggest thing that became very clear to me is uh, we're still trying to figure out how our faith interacts with the, the modern world, uh, because it's moved so fast in the last 400 years, the last 200 years, last 50 years, you know, last five years. It's just been, it keeps speeding up, it seems. I think there's a point where it's going to start to slow down. And then there's a point where we catch a breath. We need to start then catching up and renewing our, our, uh, our theology, you know, how we live out our understanding or how we talk about or articulate and it's why we had the council. It's why our Holy Father right now is doing so much of what he is doing. So we need to, we need to break out of our paradigms. And so that being the case, there's a lot of education or, or re-educating or just renewing of how we think about being Catholic in the modern world. And so that's how Smart Catholics was founded. Uh, we're yeah, coming up on our second year anniversary now, and it's a complete love gift or a passion project. And, um, and it's all about trying to rediscover this story of, of where our church is and who we are today. Oh, that's so awesome. Man, there's so much that we can get into. Uh, what if we start with marketing? So, mm -hmm. I, you know, I've been, I've been thinking about and praying about this a lot where, uh, I think the Catholic church has the greatest product in human history, which is eternal salvation. And yet like we as Catholics have a hard time getting people to buy into this product, um, which, which I think is a, a shame. And, and the more that I've been 
learning about marketing and the more that I've kind of just baptized some of the ideas or how can we apply that to Catholics and getting Catholics inspired or, you know, getting people on, on board with how beautiful and awesome the church is. So I don't know, what are your thoughts when, um, you know, in, in, you talked about the combining of marketing and your faith, are, are there any parallels or things that to learn from that? Yeah. You know, what's so funny about that is I remember years ago before I started taking marketing seriously, I found one guy, I think who was online who wasn't Catholic or anything, but he deconstructed, you know, Catholicism as a brand. And he's like, man, these guys have got it made, right? They have kind of like Apple does, right? They've got a yeah. phenomenal message. They have consistent bending around the world. They have, you know, dedicated ambassadors that go through training. You know, they've got an onboarding program, uh, program, you know, they've got an outreach program. So it's, it's basically, you know, I'd never thought about our faith from, from that standpoint. And um, I kind of went down that rabbit hole for a couple of years. And that's where, you know, I think on the one hand, uh, marketing has a, uh, a risk of where we can run up into our heads to learn the techniques of strategy and psychology mm -hmm. and human nature and storytelling and so on. And I think that we have been burned by that. We have seen that happen everywhere where we have companies that have manipulated uh, beautiful messages and beautiful stories and visuals. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of scratch, you know, get under the surface and then there's nothing actually there. And then you, mm -hmm. of course you lose customer confidence in the long term and so on. But the same thing happens, I think with, with any faith, uh, and in particular with our faith, when you have people who are all about evangelizing and stopping people from, you know, deconstructing their faith or, uh, who are basically all into it for the the marketing side, you end mm -hmm. up with a lot of prosellet what do you call it proselytizing right where where you're convinced of an outcome and you want to get other people to come on board and see it the way that that you do now there's nothing wrong when you know when you absolutely love something like it's, I think we're all far better evangelists for Star Trek than we are for <laughs> you know the Eucharist um <laughs> because it's it's a world that or it's a thing that that emerges out of an actual love for it you know or not just mm -hmm. Star Trek any fandom Marvel yeah. whatever sure. it emerges out of an actual love and then you find somebody else who also loves that thing and then you go you too I think that's what C.S. Lewis said that's the definition of a friend is going oh my gosh you too love this same thing um, I think that attitude kind of started working on me like a seed from from the inside out and I would you know. I was trying to learn how to do marketing because I'm very much self-taught in, in everything. Um, so I wanted to go and read the books and, and, you know, play the, the LinkedIn game for like two years. Can I crack it? You know, <laughs> what do I got to do to win? You know? Yeah. And after like two solid years of just burning myself out, trying to do that, what I realized is one, I, I don't think I have the capacity for that because I'm a different kind of person and there are different kinds of people. And I think that's kind of rule number one about marketing. But if you think about marketing in terms of human relations, marketing is about mm -hmm. communicating. Marketing is not about just selling something. Um, if we actually believe that we can start to live the life of heaven here and now, that the kingdom is here and it's at hand and all you got to do is close your hand and you've, you've got it. Yeah. Not it's just coming down the pike. No, no, it's already here. Christ is already here. We can enter into a living relationship with the Trinity here and now, and it can be life transforming and death loses its sting and has no meaning anymore. Well, I mean, it still has meaning, but it doesn't have a, it's not a deadline. Mm. Okay. It's just a phase change or, you know, yeah. whatever you want to call it. Life becomes completely different inside a Christian Catholic worldview. And so much of our viewpoints change. So much of our, our compulsions change, our attachments, our fears. So much of that just melts away. And we, we can look at the, the great mystics and the great saints. They're radically different people. Yeah. And they'll have their flaws, you know, but they're not, um, they're on fire with the love of God, but they are maximally forgiving with other people mm -hmm. to a point where 
we can't actually handle them. They're a little bit embarrassing. <laughs> you know, you, you need to get with the program, whoever. It's like you're 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 <laughs> you run the risk of confusing people, but they're not. They're they're playing a different game. They're seeing things, you know, from a different. They're well, they're playing a different game. There's an awesome book. Maybe you've heard of it, The Infinite Game, by Simon yeah. Sinek. Yep. Um, that's probably actually why you and I chatted like a year ago, <laughs> but. Here's the point that he made in this game, and I swear this guy's got some sort of Christian thing going, but he made this point that there's two kinds of games that we play in business, but I think also in, in marketing or in our faith. There's two kinds of games. One is the game like the Nationals. You play to win. You play to beat the other team and to win the trophy, and the game ends, and, and you're the winner. And that's one kind of game. Very valid game. But then there's another kind of game, and that's the game when you're, you're a bunch of friends and you're, and you're kids and you're out playing in the street and it's after school. And as more kids come walking home from school, more people join in to the game. And you keep evolving the rules of the game because you want to keep including more people. And then some people leave and then more people come on. And some people aren't as good and some are excellent. And so you keep bending and evolving the rules of the game because the point is not to win. The point is to keep playing the game and to keep including the most number of people. And so Simon's point was that's called an infinite game. And businesses that play that game that orient themselves towards the maximal involvement of people and for the enjoyment of the process, for the benefit of human beings, basically, those are the kinds of businesses that last longer because they're not mm -hmm. trying to win and defeat somebody else. <clears throat> Excuse me. So your values are completely different. Um, I remember reading that and thinking, oh my gosh, this guy just understood the whole Catholic thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? So this sense of um, it's like when, when the medieval cathedral builders were building cathedrals. I mean, heck, when the people, they were building the pyramids. It was the same ability to see yourself building something that's going to last or, or starting a project that you're never going to see the end of. Yeah. Right? It's going to take a hundred years. And you know you're training five generations, ten generations of people to complete this massive project. And entire communities and economies and marketplaces and, and meaning is all built up around this one massive communal project. Yeah. And when you get things like people say, peace in our time, you know, it's a beautiful idea. How practical is it? You know, as opposed to the more Catholic idea of what contribution do I make with my life towards mm -hmm. a sense of universal wholeness, a sense of integration of oneness with God and who he is today. Um, this is kind of roundabout, but there's a, uh, a book I'm reading right now about monasticism and how we need to reapproach that as uh, non-monastic people. And, and immediately people go, oh, I don't want to wear a hood and practice three vows and you know, I can't pray anymore. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not what we're talking about. The, the point of monasticism was to enter into oneness with God. That's what mon mones or monad means is, is oneness. You're entering into unity with God. And what monks would do was they would let go, they would be perfectly normal people, but they would let go of everything in their lives to practice unity with God. Mm. And in, they could only do that by living in unity with other people and by learning to come into unity with themselves. And it's that perfect triangle that, that our Lord points out, love God with all your heart and your strength and love your neighbors mm. yourself. All three of those must come together. Well, we're, they practiced a sense of stability of place. And that was the thing was they decided I'm going to commit to this physical six by four area or this particular mountainside. And this is going to be my home and I will never leave. And I will love this place and I will live out this love. And they ended up attracting just all kinds of people and villages would grow yeah. up. I'm thinking now we have a charism in the first world West or not even that every, every Catholic today to discover a stability of time. We have to understand our time and we have to live in a spirit of, of poverty, of, you know, being willing to let go and not be, uh, you know, attached to outcomes, attached to things and, to, you know, to people. Chastity is not being attached to people and mm -hmm. obedience is, you know, uh, not being attached to our own will to see things done as the way we need to. Uh, I think they're very difficult things to do, but they can also be very easy things to do. And once you kind of get it, you start to relax, you start to calm down, and you start to radiate love, the love of God, mm. because you are living out 
what God is calling you to do in this particular time in history. So we can't be running away from the past or running into the future. It's going to happen. But mm-hmm. right now is where we need to be. Kind of, if you'd like to think about quantum mechanics, we're constantly collapsing the potentialities of the future into a present reality, right? <laughs> but unless you're, you've cleaned your apparatus, unless your eye is clear and it's not full of darkness, you're not going to make the, the right decisions. You're going to keep having a hard time. So, okay, all of that's kind of everywhere. Where am I going with this? It comes down to that marketing thing. If marketing is the sharing of something that you love because you actually believe it's going to transform somebody's life uh, and it's going to make their lives easier or better, um, and it's something that you're marketing because you actually believe it, not just because you're trying to make a quick buck mm. on the weekend, but you actually believe it. If you do actually believe it, then your life has to show it. Before you mm-hmm. can talk about inner peace and the transforming love of God and so on, where are you in that? Where am I in that? Now, honestly, yeah. that's where I've been. The last 10 years was I realized I need to shut up and stop blogging and, and proselytizing, which is what I was doing, where it was all in my head. You know, Beautiful ideas come in, beautiful ideas come out, nothing goes below the neck, <laughs> right? And that's a problem because until you actually start living out of it, out of that, until you actually start loving out of that space and loving other people and loving yourself out of that space, then it's always a head trip. And it all, all it takes is one tragic life experience to rationalize yourself into making a totally different choice. So marketing in terms of our faith is something that we're all called to, to do, but we're all called to stop, find that inner room of silence find a way to enter into that and meet who's always there waiting. And until we can learn to do that out of a sense of, of reverence and attention, our words will always ring hollow. You know, no amount of marketing will ever actually work because it's not actually coming out of Christ. Yeah. The, I think what you were saying, you know, as, as I kind of put this together of marketing without the love that like, if you don't live it, then marketing is just manipulation because you're just trying to, you're just trying to influence other people to do things that you don't believe. But, but when you live it, when you believe it, when you think that this is the best way to live, this is something awesome that you just want to share. I think of um, our son who he, he loves to talk to people. He's five years old. And if, you know, if you get him talking, he'll tell you about Jesus and the mass and uh, and he'll tell you about Lord of the Rings. Like if, if he, you know, sometimes he'll, we'll meet people and he'll be like, Hey, do you know the Hobbit? I'll be like, oh, no, 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 because he'll be like, yeah. And then he just talks for an hour about Lord of the Rings. Cause it's so, like, he just loves it. And, but it's so natural for him. And I think sometimes we miss that as Catholics of, um, evangelizing is awkward. Talking to people about the faith is awkward, but it doesn't have to be because we naturally, um, what am I thinking of? Like connect with other humans just based off of our life experiences. If you, if you see a movie or a TV show that you really like, then it, it's natural to just tell your friends about it. Say, Hey, have you seen this? Check this out. Or, you know, it, um, I think that's one of the cool parts about our faith today is how, how easy it can be to share things like, Hey man, have you seen this YouTube video? Like, this is awesome. Send it that way. Uh, or check out this podcast. And, uh, it's a very, uh, non-threatening way to just share your life and, and to be able to share the gospel with people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't, one, one question I was thinking about as you were saying this is if, if you were to think of the Catholic church as a, you know, as a brand, as, as a business, and then you were to think about the steps of marketing about, you know, it like kind of attracting cold customers or onboarding people or getting people into your funnel or, you know, whatever term you want to use, it, it does seem like that we still have a disconnect with the Catholic church because you look at, you know, the, the statistics of the category of nuns, N-O-N-E-S, of, of people who have no affiliation to religion is growing. And it seems like based off the numbers that, um, you know, the Catholic church uh, attendance and people who identify as Catholics is dwindling. So where, where are we, you know, where are we lacking in this process of inspiring and onboarding and, and getting people to be Catholic? I think, I mean, that's, isn't that the million dollar question? Um, (laughs) You know, I've got a, I'm still, you know, grappling with, well, one, what my answer might be to this, um, but also how to think about this. And that's actually, 
I like those those nice Zen phrases where they're like, ask the right question, and then the answer reveals itself. And sometimes I think this is partly out of my own experience, uh, my own observations of the church, where it is now, where, what it's not yet doing, and then what people are looking for, especially especially young people, right? Mm-hmm. And I think this is actually one of the reasons why I wanted to start Smart Catholics is because um, I'm absolutely intrigued and, and fascinated by uh, history. That's actually kind of how God got to me. It was through archaeology um, and ancient earth, stuff like that. But it's a different stu- discussion. Um, archaeology, science, I'm absolutely intrigued by stuff like quantum mechanics and entanglement and, and evolution and what that means and what we need to start renewing to start integrating that. Uh, and then also, of course, our faith, how to articulate that out of the resurrection renewal where each one of us in our own faith lives must be Mary Magdalene at Easter morning, uh, welcoming the resurrected Christ, not as a moment in the past, but as an ever renewed day. What does all that mean, given where our world is right now, right? Of course, I don't have the answer. But (laughs) um, so to start answering your question, here's what I see. I see two things. One, the first world West is is grappling with something that has been kind of growing for for a while. And uh, when you look at other places around the world, you are seeing a revival of passion and of life commitment among young people. Um, I'm given to understand Africa is just booming with with vocations and family growth and so on mm. because they have that they have that simple faith. And they see it lived out. And I think that's actually the kicker. And I think that's always going to be the kicker. Catholic faith grows through transmission. It grows like a wildfire. There has to literally be an actual spark to communicate fire. You can't do it over an email list. You know, you can you can show what it can look like, you can demonstrate a life, but you yourself, me myself, must be alive in Christ, mm-hmm. uh, to be able to, to make some meaningful contribution or to even be talking about the right things in the right way. Um, so I see a lot of young people, the, all of these nuns, what they're doing is they're not affiliating with religious structures because they don't agree with the scandals that have happened. They don't agree with mm-hmm. the people that they've seen. They've been manipulated by the media and <laughs> we've done our own fair share of silly talk and, you know, not living things out in you know, the best way. So there's a lot of very poor examples running around. And for several generations in the first world West, you know, um, we got comfortable. I think we got really comfortable, yeah. not just from catechesis, comfortable in not feeling like we actually needed to do any inner work. You, 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 you yeah. learn the stuff go through RCIA, you punch the card, you show up to mass, you tithe, you know, but all of this stuff is all the external stuff. And that's the, um, uh, that's the the kind of thing that our Lord was battling against with the Pharisees. And he's like, everything is external, right? I was just thinking about this the other day where he was like, you know, you need to have faith greater than the Pharisees to get into heaven. And I remember, I remember, you know, if you imagine the poor people, right? In mm. that time, life is a caste system. Basically, up until 400 years ago, everything is a caste system. You don't yeah. really move between the castes, even in medieval society. You know, uh, it's very stratified. You're born where you are. You basically stay where you are. And then maybe there's some exceptions. So in the ancient world, you didn't get into like the afterlife unless you were an awesome servant mm-hmm. of pharaoh the nobles because they're the ones that god's favorite well, how do you know well because they're nobles and kings right <laughs> yeah. so how you participate and support them in their lives is how you you kind of scoot in on their coattails and that's why you get things like mass graves in the ancient worlds because they're like well i'm you know i don't have any other, any other reason to be alive so let's send me along now um so that's the attitude of the ancient you know hebrews that's kind of floating around in there and then our lord says no 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 it's you have to surpass them and then in the next chapter he's like they're whitewashed sepulchers 
So you got to be better than them and they suck. So what's <laughs> the 1% that you need to do yourself? Right. So I think that, um, there's nothing wrong with, with, you know, materiality and satisfying your, your Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Right. I think all that is incredibly important. And I think half of us get incredibly defensive about the, the progress that has been made, the good progress about the things that we have accumulated to create a space of safety so that we could actually breathe and then think about how can we improve the entire world. Right? And I think there's the other side that reacts with a sense of survivor's guilt. And they're like, mm. I've got all this stuff and there are yeah. so many around the world who don't. I must be an absolutely terrible person for hoarding. Yeah. <laughs> And then you get kind of the middle road or the greater road, which is the saints. And the saints are like, I've got all this stuff. What am I going to do with it? How am I going to help mm. people with it? How am I going to get, allow this to give me a springboard of peace? Because as, as a human physical thing, we need a space of biological safety so that certain areas of our brain can stop panicking and <laughs> yeah. you know, cycling into trauma and surviving, you know. And then actually move over into the more creative, the more intuitive, um, the less analytical and dualistic, contemplative side. Nobody contemplates when you're being hunted by a saber-toothed tiger. <laughs> so <laughs> carving out that space of peace. I think that is the, the charism the first world has been gifted that we've you know, created for ourselves. Uh, and I will attribute, we, I think we have to attribute this to the Holy Spirit. But now once we're here, now what do we do? We have to put this at the service of the rest of the developing world. And we can't really rest until everybody is able to rest and be able to kind of get off the, the edge of the cliff, uh, you know, because only in that rest as a human, again, that, from that biological space, can we then start waking up to our spiritual lives, right? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of young people today are the first generation that's ever grown up with a global consciousness, or I should say a global mm, yeah. awareness of the interconnectedness of the human family. I think the previous generation to us was aware of a global jigsaw puzzle, but I'm still fighting mm. for my country. Now I have nothing of course against national borders and I don't, but there's a difference of awareness. And I think that the tools that have become normalized for the, the new and the young generation have helped us to see how fast and easy and instantaneous it is to connect with a human being and not just a label anywhere mm. else across the planet. This has never happened in human history. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of our religious formation, our theological formation, has been slow to catch up. Um, a lot of our politics has been slow to catch up. And mm. I think a lot of young people are still intensely spiritual. And that's why they're always check, yeah, I'm still spiritual. It's not that they're leaving religiosity. Mm -hmm. They are fed up with what they've perceived to be how to actually live out a spiritual reality. Because they're not all going and being atheists. Some of them mm -hmm. are. Um, and then those, some of those who do become atheists become intensely religious about their atheism. Because yeah. they kind of have to, right? Yeah. Um, so, like I said, how do, we answer, how do we ask the right question? And I'm still trying to find the right question. I don't think mm -hmm. that there is a complete answer, but I think an answer that um, our generation needs to discover, this young generation of Catholics, we get a, uh, like, again, this great sense of global interconnectedness, the idea of the human family, not just my family and my mm -hmm. particular tribe. There's the human family. In that context, the church shows up in a totally different light. This is why mm -hmm. I have such a great, you know, appreciation for Pope Francis and what he's doing and how he's articulating and how he's refocusing, you know, where we need to be putting our energies. You know, we're not losing sight of anything, any ground that's been gained or, you know, any things that are true, but there are other things that this generation is catching on to and putting energy into and recognizing is important. He's like, okay, how does the church then help provide guidance in those areas? Because if that's where you want to be, how do I meet you where you are with that? And that sort of comes back to that point we were talking earlier. Um, if the Catholic Church, if your Catholicism, if your um, your connect to, connection to true reality, to God, to 
Christ in the Eucharist to your, your faith life. If all of that is actually true, and you're not actually, you know, worried because nothing can separate us from the love of Christ, not height or distance, even sin, and he will come chasing you down to the narrowest parts of your being, you know, and then outwit you to, to welcome you back, you know, and then lavish you with grace. If that is a truth that we believe that is held out to every single human being, and we've been gifted a kind of a look at the cards, we're still on exactly the same playing field as every other human being. Maybe we have been given a gift of knowing something a little bit more clearly. But if we're not actually living that out, that's why I love something Jordan Peterson says. People ask him, do you believe in God? Right? And he'll spend 10 minutes deconstructing that question. It's like, what do you mean by believe? What do you mean by God? Because if you're actually serious about what the, what's in those terms, it is utterly terrifying, utterly life transforming, and there is no way you could ever go back. Mm -hmm. What does believe mean? Believe does not mean to intellectually ascend. It means to actually mm -hmm. live out. And that's the cool thing about humans, right? is we don't decide, hey, I love this thing, I'm going to go do it. We start doing something and then realize we love it and decide, I like mm -hmm. who I am when I'm doing this and I'm going to keep doing this. Or if we decide I don't like who I am when I'm doing this, then we either stop or we go into depression until we actually make a change. But we are a people that do things. Belief is a doing of mm -hmm. you know, the loving, of the thinking. So on the one hand, if you, this is something you truly, truly love, and you're truly leaping out of, you're not going to feel a sense of competition or conflict with any other human being. You're in every interaction online, in person at the grocery mm -hmm. store, you're purely going to look for the, the human connection. What is it you and I both love? Because you have to start with friendship. Yeah. Um, what is it you and I both love? Because if we don't share something that makes us both look at each other and go, I think I would like to spend an extra five minutes with you, right? Because like you're saying, like kind of the funnel and so on, what's the end goal? Well, obviously mm -hmm. Christ, Christ makes the end goal happen. But if the end goal is to share what we love, you're asking for a lifetime commitment. This is not buying a new iPhone. And then, you know what? I can't stand the Apple community. I'm jumping to Android next year. It's not that kind of thing. And that's why we don't take responsibility for somebody else's um, conversion. Mm -hmm. but we have to take responsibility for who we are because we may never have a conversation with somebody that actually goes into the point, do you accept Jesus as your personal Lord mm -hmm. and Savior? That may not always be appropriate, um, but you do need to have an answer for the joy that is within you. And if people look at your lives and they go, I, I want to know why how you can be so calm, how you can be so happy, where you get the energy to just show up, be good to people every day. Like, I want that. I mean, you see that with anybody. People see that with the Dalai Lama. People mm -hmm. see that with, you know, preachers who go to Africa and just give their lives. You know, that is the authentic living out of Christ. And that's why it's not something that the church has ever has said is exclusive to our Catholic faith. That living out of Christian witness is something anybody can live out. Now, are they mm -hmm. doing it consciously? And are they, you know, are they doing it in concert with Christ? You know, I think that is the thing that Catholics have an opportunity to bring. Yeah, you you bring up a really good point of, you know, if you look at what it, what would be the point of marketing if Catholic, if if Catholicism was a was a brand, and it's not to capture an email and just be able to send people things and it's not to drive people to here's this uh book you know to be able to read I, you know i would say the whole point of it would be to to bring them into a relationship and and i guess you know maybe that's that's a point that obviously you know is easy in in the theory but but hard to live out is to have this relationship with um your neighbors with the people in your parish and uh you know it is sad when when you hear stories of people who Maybe they they get uh, you know they hear a talk and intellectually they start to learn all these things, but then they they show up at a church and no one welcomes them and mm -hmm. everyone you know comes right at the last minute and then everyone leaves as soon as they're gone and there's no community because it would be super super hard to live out the Catholic faith without mm -hmm. 
knowing a person who is who loves it, who's on fire for it, who's dynamic, who can help you grow, who can answer these questions. If, if it's all just intellectual, you know, and, and we have such a, a deep history and faith and treasure trove worth of intellect, um, intellectual goodness. <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, so much of it just means nothing if you don't have people who are living it out, who are, who can inspire you, who can help you, who can help you grow in virtue, all of those things. Yeah. I think one one important piece of that, uh, as we talk about relating to people, is storytelling. Uh, so, because um, you know, when you, if you were to look at Christ as just this person, you you put up a picture and you gave some facts about him. Here how old, here's how old he was when he died. Here's you know this was his job and stuff. It, it's kind of uh, it's pretty hard to relate to. But when you hear the stories of what he did and you start to relate to those and when you start to learn salvation history and the story of salvation and how our lives fit into that, then that really transforms your life. And then you can meet this person of Christ. And so, yeah, I'm curious. I, I know that you're, you're a writer and avid about storytelling and, and what are, what are some functions of maybe a good story and how can we as Catholics use that to get people to relate to the church and ultimately to Christ? You know what I think is, um, well, somebody who actually modeled this for me in a really practical way and was then really instrumental in my own conversion and wanting to take the faith a lot more seriously is, is uh, Bishop Barron and his mm -hmm. YouTube series where he would yeah. take a popular movie and then just talk about it, take an element and tease it out. You know, what is, you know, what is good and true in this thing? Um, and I think it's Philippians 4. 14, one, I'm wonderful with scripture verses, but it's in Philippians and where, um, the, the inspired author says, you know, whatever is good, whatever is true and noble and beautiful and excellent, celebrate those. Mm -hmm. Uh, so to paraphrase, celebrate whatever is good, no matter where you find it. And I think coming back to sort of your point about storytelling, Christianity, Catholicism is a we can think of ourselves as the loving eye of God looking around at the world with an intention to love and to find what is lovable, right? Mm. That's a completely different attitude than being a knife, looking to analyze and dissect the amount of good and the amount of bad, mm. uh, or the incorrect, or the degrees of perfection in something. And this is why the church has always been, uh, especially in more recent years, as she has matured and continued to evolve her articulation of the Christian thing, of the gospel, um, she more freely and willingly uh, celebrates whatever is good and true and noble and excellent in every culture, no matter where it's found, um, and looks to salvage those things, looks to save those things, um, not in spite of their cultures, kind of like a, a museum just going around, you know. Uh, like an artifact hunter, uh, Indiana Jones, just sort of gathering everything up into one archive, you know, no, to actually find it like Father Matteo Ricci going into China as, as a Jesuit, you know, in the, what is it, 1700s, 1600s, and learning the Chinese culture from the inside out so that he could mm -hmm. embody um, Christian living, Catholic living, the Catholic ideas through their culture and how they see the world. Um, I think that we often, uh, uh, don't take seriously enough how someone's culture uh, emerges out of their biology, emerges out of their soul, out of their spiritual outlook. And cultures can be so different. Have you seen the movie, um, that sci-fi movie, Arrival? No, I don't no? think so. Okay, I'd, I'd recommend everybody go watch that movie. <laughs> I mean... Um, uh, well, it's been out for a couple of years. So I'm assuming if you haven't seen it, you know, I'll try not to give it away. But basically it's, it's the idea that one day aliens arrive, but they show up as massive obelisks kind of floating in the mm -hmm. sky. And we can't communicate with them because they speak a completely different language. Everything about their language is completely foreign to us. So we have to create a bridge and learn how to speak like them to understand what it is they're trying to communicate. Well, something mm -hmm. happens as we learn to do that. Um, the, the, the main characters who, who are running the programs and 
interfacing with these great beings and so on, they start to change even in their biology and their nerves, their, how, their outlook. That starts to change as they start to learn a new language because language is more than just a, a new dictionary you download. It's a new way of looking at the world, a new way of seeing the world, of interacting with the world. And I'm not a phenomenologist here, but you're taking on a new phenomenological you know, uh, interaction with mm -hmm. reality. And that can completely change you. Um, after watching that movie, I thought, this is what life is like for Christians who have sacred scripture. You know, the God arrived, the inspired authors came and gave us these incredible things, and we start reading them, and they start changing us. We can't mm. be the same once we start taking these messages seriously. Um, yeah. It's not just a head trip. It actually starts reworking who you are. So... Um, I think that right there is a fantastic point of, of kind of where I'm going. Um, every generation has new stories that it cottons onto, new stories that form a, a tissue of connectivity, you know, mm -hmm. uh, a series of, of images and things that, that a generation uses to talk about and things that are normal things that people love. Um, get to know those stories. You know, get to know what is popular and get to know what is what is good. And and half the time, excuse me, there's I, I believe you can always find something interesting or something good that can be talked about. Because what you want is the kind of, oh, you too attitude. You want mm. that all the time. I mean, you want that in marketing. Every email you send out, you want your your audience to go, oh, you too? How did you crawl inside <laughs> my head? And and you just you knew what I, you know. Well, because you're you know what is inside their head, because you know what's in your head. And that's the number one kind of calling. I'm, I'm working through the um, interior castle right now by St. Mm -hmm. Teresa of Avila. It's awesome. Her first, cent her first chapter, she's like, until we know ourselves, we are incapable of, of living a better life or of entering into the spiritual journey. And then she breezes past that one little line. And that's where you get the disciplines of psychology and therapy mm -hmm. and you know, all of these things. They're not to replace confession. They're to complement it. We never realized mm -hmm. we needed these extra disciplines to literally talk through what am i thinking what is going on in me what in, what is acting on me you know why do i love certain stories why do i just i love certain movies i keep going back to them and most of us never actually are, you know have the space to slow down and and think about it yeah. some of us do and if you do it's kind of your job in the culture to help people sit through that and talk about that you know, why does this mean something to you? There's something in you that is calling out to that character, to that story. So short answer is get to know what is popular and why people like it. And if you've got a friend, start to find out what they like to watch as, as stories. Because once you create that foundation, you know, if you have no idea the stories another person loves, you have no idea who that person is. You mm -hmm. can get to know another culture through the stories that they tell about themselves, about the world. Yeah. And, Right, so get to know another culture's mythology, um, get to know another culture's or origin myths and folk tales mm -hmm. and whatever. Um, once you do that, once you've built up literally a common language with that other person, yes, we all speak English, um, but but Trekkies and and Gateheads live in different universes. Right, they they hold up <laughs> different characters. They got different examples, and that's what the church does. That's why the church is a renewing church in every generation. She needs to take her message and then renew it according to what is now kind of in vogue in that time. You're not losing your identity. You're just finding out, you know, with everything that's moving, especially in our generation, that's so fast. Mm -hmm. What are things that are, that are good that we can use that make for perfect examples? You know, like you could not have used the character of Aragorn 50 years ago to describe a model of masculinity you know christ-like masculinity or to talk about like with with um you know frodo or mm -hmm. uh i don't know if you um that show called midnight mass on netflix right which is kind of a horror show but a lot of people really enjoyed watching that and so i went i went to give it a go and realized this is a, a parable of how you feel when the thing that you love becomes a monster and the thing you're told mm -hmm. is true becomes terrible and all I can think about is people who've endured scandal, you know, at, at the hands of 
clerics or guardians or people they trusted in the church. How do you yeah. respond to that? How do you, you know, it's in that, from that point of view, my goodness, is it a very hard um, and, and needed discussion? Mm -hmm. uh, but again, because it's a story, what stories do is stories are like um, you get to experience somebody else's life. You know, you're, you're leaving your own body and your own experience to experience something else that somebody goes through. And if somebody mm -hmm. else is sharing their story with you, um, you're able to enter into that story. You start living out that story inside you. Your mind's eye starts to see it. Maybe your body starts to experience it. Heck, we love this stuff. I mean, we get addicted. I mean, that's why you have Netflix. That's why we have cinemas, you know. <laughs> it's because we love experiencing not our lives. We love watching somebody else's trauma and kind of pretending it's ours yeah. for a little bit, you know, and then how they deal with that. And then if we kind of watch that enough times, then we hope that when we are put in the situation like that, we've kind of rehearsed it enough times mm -hmm. to where it's going to come easy. That's why stories are crucial for all of human history. We've retold them and retold them. And now in the last hundred years, they have absolutely exploded. There are now so many stories in a way. It's like St. Paul walking up, you know, to the, the, uh, the, the Agora, I think it was the forum. And he's like, I want to tell you about this one God here. Right. Um, because there's like 50 statues. Um, yeah, yeah. Today there's now 50,000 statues and there's maybe still one. Most of us have like 50,000 stories in our heads. Um, and then there's the one empty space, which is the space of holy mystery. Part you can't quite answer and you know you have to have some sort of relationship with. And you're blind to it, but you're still acting your whole life, you know, out of an attempt to orient towards that. Mm -hmm. Catholic is the one who is able to start to see or should be, you know, have to cultivate a mystical eye. Someone who looks, tries to look at reality the way God looks at reality. God does not look with an eye of judgment. Um, he looks with an eye of love. Constant, um, just constant love. Uh, perfect parable being the, um, was it? The, the, the prodigal son. Mm. He comes running out to this kid and just throws everything at him. All he needs is the intent for the, 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 the person to want to do a good thing the bare minimum good thing. Yeah. And then he just avalanches him with everything to encourage that journey. Can we truly look at ourselves and our family and friends and, you know, and, and think, am I modeling that? You know, with the caveat, yes, I know you need to have boundaries. Yes. Mm -hmm. Narcissism is its own pandemic, you know, and, and we kind of, as a culture in, the, in America, in the first world West elevated that to an art form. Yeah, you, th that is a very serious discussion, uh, and you do need to have things like boundaries. But for those who are trying to be good people, you know, and who do want to spend time with you, are you modeling that kind of prodigality of, of love? You can only mm -hmm. do that if you're beginning to witness it to yourself. And that's kind of where it's a catch-22, where you can't witness it to yourself or see it in yourself unless you're offering it to other people. And then you can only offer it to others if you're doing it. You have to just start. That's why it's kind of like in fear and trembling, or as I like to say, in, in reverence and attention. You just have to start doing that. You have to start trying to figure out both at the same time. Going back to what mm -hmm. we were saying earlier, that's what we do as human beings. We're like potential collapsing entities. We take all the potentialities of every moment in the future, and we collapse it down into a single choice. And invariably, we're, we're always doing the best that we can. I believe that. Yep. Um, in a given moment, even when we make a bad choice, at that point, we're still being pulled by love. Now, at that moment, we think that this thing is the love that needs to be pulling me, and it can be a very bad choice, terrible choice. But at that moment, it feels like, this is what I need to be doing. And then we retrospect on that and realize, okay, I, I need to regret that. I need to sit with that. I need to rest in why that was you know, less than, that was missing the mark. And then get back to focusing on what is the next right thing that I can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, I think what you said kind of stood out to me about the, about knowing other people's stories. And, uh, you know, that's something that's, that's super important when you're talking to other people. If, if you were to just start spewing gospel verses at people, then, yeah. uh, it, like, <laughs> It it totally it depends on the person. It depends on what, how they grew up, their stories, their culture, like all of these things um, about how you can 
inspire them and influence them. And I, I think that's kind of an important lesson of of learning the stories that the stories that they're telling themselves in their head. Mm-hmm. What right. is their what's their perception of the Catholic Church and uh, how did they grow up? Um, did, you know, did, were they Catholic and now they're not? Why? What? What was it? Uh, and just, I think, just an authentic caring of people and getting to know them, and 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 therefore getting to to know the stories mm-hmm. of not only the stories they're telling themselves, but the stories that they love. Like mm-hmm. that just tells so much about people. And then once you start to learn those stories, maybe they do. Maybe they have. Um, a misconception about the Catholic church. They're telling themselves a story about their head that, uh, you know, they met someone who was a Catholic and he was a jerk. So all Catholics are jerks. And now you can use kind of the power of the art of your own stories. You're still telling your example, the people that you've met the saints mm-hmm. and to kind of maybe, um, rephrase or rework a little bit of their stories that they're telling in their mind about, you no, know, I mean, you know, am I, do you think I'm a jerk? And they're like, no, like, okay, well, I'm Catholic. So all Catholics might not be jerks. And, how and so, how yeah, often so, do we all do that? I mean, I do that. Mm-hmm. And I'm sad to say, we, we all just do it. Now we do it because it's partly a survival thing. It's how you have yeah. to get by. You know, it's, it's a very mm-hmm. natural human thing. And that's kind of the point of, of being a mature Christian is waking up and not just sleepwalking through your yeah. life, through your thoughts. How many times do people say to you, you know, you can't tell me that you, you don't know me. You don't know my life. Yeah. You know? When anytime that starts to come up and you're like, that's a fantastic, eh, you've, you know, we're going about this wrong. You know, there's a chance of, of losing a friendship before it's even started. You know, that's why the, the I think the, the story of Christ at the well with the Samaritan woman is so beautiful. Um, where, uh, yes, we can emulate him, but it's with a caveat that he is also seen as a rabbi, as a teacher in that situation. Most of us don't actually show up uh, to be seen as a respected teacher in somebody else's life worthy of dispensing wisdom. We just show up as another human being that maybe they've got to figure out if you're safe to listen to or not. But what does he do? Um, she's not even in the same religion as, as he is. They don't worship the same way. Um, the lines are, are drawn very harshly between their two cultures. And he sits there and he asks her, would you please give me water? And she's showing up in the middle of the day because she's trying to avoid anybody talking to her. She's yeah. got a sense, you know, it's a shame at what's going on. Everybody's, she's an outcast. She doesn't want to have to deal with anybody. It's baking hot. And it's very hard to draw water at the middle of the day. So he leans over and asks her, can I have some of your water? So he's initiating not, you know, are you saved? You know, or are you, yeah, yeah. you know, where are you in your faith journey or something like that? Or, you know, why aren't you Catholic yet? Yeah. But he starts with kid. <laughs> Could you help me maybe with a biological need I have, Mm -hmm. you know, or maybe I can help you with one. What's something, how can I help you create a little bit of, maybe a little bit of safety? You know, I think we all love people who make us feel safe. Yeah. Right. That's a fantastic first place to start. If you don't feel like you're going to be a threat, um, it's a great way to start a conversation. And that's what he does. Now, again, she respects him. She calls him rabbi. And so he then is in a role where he can, you know, very kindly start to push and start to ask. But notice how he's never harsh and judging. Um, he's always inviting her to think more deeply about, about herself, you know, about what she needs to be doing, who she needs to start becoming, because it does ultimately fall down to her choice. And I think human beings have the ultimate power in the universe, this phenomenal capacity to resist and to resist something until the end, because we will hold on to our freedom. Um, and maybe we'll rationalize that or find a way. And that's an incredible power. And it's a testament to the incredible power of being a human being. But when you can love something, you will love it. And if it just depends on what you're choosing to do, we do not respond well to being forced. And if, if we do, and we sort of collapse because we can't bear up under that. It's kind of like a black hole. You just sort of collapse down. Um, that's never going to be a good thing to, to, you know, force on people. So I think that point, if somebody ever says to you, you don't know me, you don't know my life, you know, that's, that's a good little indicator right there. Yeah, man, this has been so good. Um, Dominic, where can people go to find out more about smart Catholics and, and all the stuff that you have going on right now? Sure. So. Smart Catholics, it's at uh, smartcatholics.com. It's a, as you said earlier, it's a social network for 
faithful ordinary Catholics. Um, we are currently the fastest growing network or community to support the Holy Father and uh, kind of create a home away from Facebook, um, free of trolls and toxicity and ads. And it's it's this growing kind of online community center of just different ministries, creating events, creating courses, creating groups, you know, sharing resources. And that's kind of what this comes down to is creating resources to renew our hope. Uh, we need to be renewing our hope. And sometimes that means we need to think about things a little bit differently. And so that's why we start with smart, but we end with Catholic. Because uh, Catholic is not all Thomas Aquinas and scholastics. Catholic is also St. Francis and St. Hildegard of Bingen and, you know, people living that that love um, because they're actually alive and wanting to be alive and on, on that journey together. Um, as far as, our, you know, storytelling, that's an, a different side project. You can go to catholicauthor.us, and that is the creative community for Catholic fiction writers. Um, so we have all kinds of fun stuff going on over there as well. And that's part of Smart Catholics as well. So people can check both of those out. Awesome. Well, we will leave links to all of those in the description below. So I highly recommend people check those out. You have a YouTube channel as well that you do some great interviews on. So we'll link to those. And yeah, just thank you again for our listeners. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you got some value and some, some ideas that you could bring forward and, and start to live out today. So just know that um, we are praying for you all until next time. Thank you so much and God bless. Thanks everyone. Thank you.